expenditure benchmark. However, certain transactions um, are uh, classified as uh, out, being outside general government. So uh, a classic example is, is um, um, certain investments. So some of the investments in, in the banks uh, were classified as, as equity investments. Uh, so they didn't count towards the deficit. However, insofar as we either borrowed the money or not repaid money that we could have otherwise repaid, it's still within our debt. So it's, it's, that's the dichotomy. It, it, the, there is, in essence, any money borrowed by any, any general government body is general government debt. Uh, so there's no borrowing outside of that. It's all about whether it counts for the deficit calculation and then for the rest of the fiscal rules, the, the structural balance rule and the expenditure benchmark. I hope that explains it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I... I it was just on that point. Then. On that point, Sorry. Um, briefly. It, yes. It's just, it's getting very Jesuitical here um, about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. The, are you clar saying that the EU is banning Ireland from spending savings, not borrowings? The, the pension reserve fund, the strategic investment fund, was built up over years. We're not borrowing it. Do you know what I mean? It's like if a family needs to spend money that they've saved. It's not adding to the debt. Yeah. Right, so what I'm trying to, that if the EU rules are that severe that we can't even spend money that we have built up over years, we're not, that, I, 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 that's what I was trying to ask you earlier and I didn't really get the answer. Is there some, it's just getting Jesuitical, you, you three are the experts and yet you're not even able to point to one example, like you mentioned some vague thing about France, where this has happened. So if we have to break the EU rules to build houses for our people, I'm putting it to you that we should break them. But if you can tell us a different way that we don't, I'm all ears. Uh, well, I'll answer your, your technical question there at the start. Um, general government expenditure and general government revenue are calculated or uh, measured by reference to the European system of accounts 2010. It's uh, an annual system. So you're actually perfectly correct. It looks at what your revenue is in a given year and what your expenditure is in a given year. Um, and that's what it measures, and that's how we calculate the headline deficit, and then that's the starting point for the structural balance and so forth. Um, so you're right, if, if money in fact was raised in earlier years and put aside and then spent, it counts as general government expenditure when it was spent. When it came in in the first place, it was counted as revenue in the year at which it came in. So th that's just a fact of life, that's the way the, essentially the accounting system works. Um, we're looking at, you know, and all our targets then are set on this annual basis. So in terms of up until this year, the straight deficit, now we're into the preventive arm. So we're talking about the structural balance and complying with the expenditure benchmark. But we have, we have to look at what we spend in a given year uh, and what the revenue is in a given year. And revenue from earlier years doesn't count. Uh, there's no offset for it because it was recognised when it arrived in in the first place. But isn't that ludicrous that there is no offset for it? Because we, we actually do have money, but we're not even allowed to spend it by the EU for the most needy thing in the whole country. That, that's just getting into the overall statistical system and, and straight beyond us. There are one or two colleagues who have brief supplementary questions, and I'll take them. Deputy O'Brien, firstly. Thanks, and, and it's just to tease out a little bit further the, the, the off-balance sheet options that are, that are potentially there. So. We have a potentially significant investment capacity in ISAF, and we have a vehicle that we know works in terms of NARPs, whether you keep it as NARPs or NARPs too. The difficulty is, if it's used as a way of providing 100% social housing, there's no commercial return because social housing is subsidised by the state, so clearly it'll fall foul on those grounds. The difficulty for many members here is, if it's used for private housing with a Part 5 10% commitment, it won't produce sufficient social housing to tackle the scale of the crisis that we're concerned about. So, and again, I, I, you know, I'm kind of asking the question knowing you're probably not going to be able to answer it, but if, for example, NARPS, accessing ISAF funding was to make a, a, a call of invitations to people with land, they could be local authorities, they could be approved housing bodies or whoever, to come forward with proposals for mixed tenure estates, which would include social housing, cost rental housing, and affordable purchase housing. My preference would be for the local authorities to bring forward its land banks and say, on this land we would like to uh, provide 30% social housing, 30% cost rental, 30%
cost purchase or affordable purchase. It would be a, a local authority managed estate, but the, the financing model would allow for a commercial return both from the affordable sales and the cost rentals. And those could be used to ensure that there was a commercial return back to NARPS and ISEF through the initial loan. But it would allow you to produce housing on a scale that private housing with 10% Part 5 commitments wouldn't allow. It would also allow you to leverage in the land banks that many local authorities, Dublin City, South Dublin and others, already have. And it would also, because while Colm uh, Deputy Brophy is wrong. It's not that, look, that the housing bodies don't want to borrow. In fact, if you talk to the five or six large approved housing bodies, they probably reckon within a couple of years they could be producing 4,000 units a year from the 15 or 1,600 that they have at present. Even at that capacity, it wouldn't meet the needs that are there. But I'm just wondering, is something in that kind of space a p potential to explore uh, within the, the framework that's already there? Because if we don't find some way of doing something like that, off-balance sheet stuff is really just private housing with 10%, so part five, which is nowhere near enough. Mr. O'Kelly, Mr. Mr. I mean, that's. I think that is exactly what, what you're describing. Is what we're is what we're exploring. It, that that it would qualify. That. Sorry, Chair, just. Dublin City Council, for example, are currently looking at a similar model, but bringing in the private sector, so they're leveraging their land. The difficulty is when you bring in the private sector, the cost of building the units, including all the compliance, is significantly higher than it is if you have the local authorities. So I'm specifically interested in a local authority partnership where it leverages in land, it brings down the cost of production, producing the units well below the private sector, but it's still off balance sheet because you have the commercial return from the affordable uh, and the purchase. I believe it's possible. The difficulty with that is, because this is something the Housing Committee is going to have to tease out, those rents would be incredibly high, potentially, to sustain meeting the criteria. No, so, no I, think, I, think the, I think Deputy O'Brien was a mix. Rents. You were doing... You'd have differential rents for a portion. You'd cost have, rent. I, I know. You'd have I, differential for a portion and below market rents yeah, for Yeah, I know, portion. but hang, I'm okay. well aware of what you're saying, but the cost rent is 70% of the market rate. That, no, that's look, still very that's, high rent. That's, that's a matter for deliberations. Deputy O'Brien was asking a specific question to get you know, that information, and we can deal with that as we, you got a direct answer on it. Deputy Dirk, and you had another brief Yeah, point. yeah just brief. all my questions are brief, Chairman, you know that. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to the definition of, of, of uh, uh, normal government expenditure, that includes capital and current, I presume, for the, for the purpose of this exercise. Okay. That narrows it down quite considerably, Chairman, as to what, what can be done, because in actual fact, there's a stranglehold on what, what can be done. Now, Possible options, possible options, and first of all, we appreciate, we all appreciate the difficulties that, that you have collectively, but we also have a difficulty, and it's a pressing one, and it's getting more pressing the, as the hours go by. And it's not a question of avoiding the issue and hoping that it'll go away. It's not going, these, these issues are not going to go away. They're fundamental to every household in the country, and fundamental particularly to young people. Young people are desperate now in, in the hope of obtaining a home by one means or another. And we've little to offer them. And, and you know, the rules are fine. We, we accept all that. But those rules have to become amenable to the needs of, of the community at large in this country. If they don't, then the rules fall into disrepute. So the question I want to say, what is this? What incentive is there for local authorities to hand their lands over uh, to private housing bodies? For what purpose? Was, is it not much more efficient for the local authorities to develop those lands themselves? How efficient is it, second question, how efficient is it for uh, a, the private housing bodies uh, and cost effective to obtain lands, free grants and for nothing, from the state, from the state, through the local authorities? No one have to pay for them. You get them for one euro per housing site and 100% uh, loans to, 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 to build them to the housing bodies. Now, the capital allowance scheme, that's, that's what's in the capital allowance scheme, and is, 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 is phased out now to some extent, but the general principle applies. And I cannot understand for the life of me, Mr Chairman, and I'm sure you can't either, and you're a lot more intelligent than I am, but I, I cannot understand for the life of me how it is expected that we can solve a housing problem that way. I, like, like, like my colleague, uh, Deputy Brophy, 
I believe that the housing bodies are unsuitable, their structures unsuitable, to handle the magnitude of the problem that they were faced with. And they didn't, and they couldn't, and they won't. And, they, and it's not because there's a reluctance on their part. It's because they are more suited to dealing with niche markets, such as special needs, sheltered housing, and they are excellent at that. 100% efficiency in that area, nobody will quibble on that. Thank you. But on the, on the general issue of the magnitude of the housing requirements, they are unsuitable, their the structure is not right. And the last point I want to make is this. Can you, can, there are about 90 billion in personal savings, or at least there was, unless somebody spent them since I last counted, Chairman, uh, uh, about 90 billion in personal savings. Is there any way that th that 90 billion, and again, I made the submission already to the Department of Finance, uh, and I got a negative response, um, that those personal savings could be utilised over a period of time, given the problem and the seriousness of the housing problem that we have. Thank you, thank you Deputy. Do you want to respond to? Well, it's just on the first point. I, I suppose there's an element of people, it is consumer choice on personal savings, what they do with it. The NTMA has state savings products which are available, which will go towards it. I think in the response, we just say, urge caution when you tie essentially what is this, a, a sovereign loan to a specific project, sometimes it can have a perception of being less secure, whereas the state does all its borrowing as a, as a sovereign, you know, we don't, it's similar to taxation, we don't hypothecate taxation either. Um, in terms of the other, your other points, I think, to be honest, <laughs> It's really for the, the Department of Housing, Minister for Housing, in terms of how the local authorities interact with property holders. Not. We know that. We want you to know as well. Okay. Thank you. Just, to, just to conclude, I have two very brief questions, um, Mr. O'Kelly. Uh, when Minister Noonan was asked answering questions in the Dáil recently, he referred to the fact that the NTMA were looking at different funding models, and I take it from the discussions we've had today, specifically one of those is what we're loosely calling NARP2, or a model around that, and that's fine. Earlier on in your discussions, uh, you spoke about the infrastructure, infrastructural deficits. And I take it that might be from something different, a different funding model, uh, again off balance sheet. You just might comment on that. And Mr. Dorgan or Mr. O'Kelly, um, we had the League of Credit Unions in front of this committee, who obviously had substantial funds available. And obviously, all of these projects, uh, it's the element of risk that determines what's what exactly. And I was wondering, have you any comment to make on, I suppose, those funds that are available? That, possibly could be used, but I do realise there's a cost and then there's a risk element that uh, I suppose the risk element determines what the cost is. Those two issues, please. I mean, Chairman, you're right. The two, the two specific um, uh, um, uh, financing vehicles that we think have, have, have some legs and can have some impact is the, the NARPS 2, as we're, we're now des describing it, and um, then the second one is an infrastructure fund where we would um, put ice of money uh, plus additional co-investment capital in there and provide uh, um, financing for this infrastructural deficit. Uh, uh, I mean, homes already identified, as I said earlier, by the, by the Dublin Task Force in, 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 in this area and indeed in, in, in other, re other parts of the country. So the idea is that you'd finance either the local authorities themselves by providing them with um, uh, attractively financed options, either through, both through the rate and the tenure, or that you might uh, 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 provide it to the developers themselves f similarly uh, um, and, and build the infrastructure for them. Right now, they, they can't get the inf infrastructure built one way or the other, and so uh, uh, some solution is needed, and we think that we could play a role there, and we've been in active discussions with both local authorities and uh, the developers in regard to that. Have you a high degree of confidence in that? I do. Thank you. And the other issue was the credit unions, League of Credit Union funding? Yeah, I suppose um, we've, we have, there have been discussions there, and certainly if the credit unions want to invest, we, uh, we you know, we'd certainly be interested in partnering with them. I think, again, it's, it is an issue on cost. We have to be able to justify paying, if it were a substantial difference to the state's borrowing rates, we'd have to have a very strong justification for that. Thus, they indicated that the, for them the interest rate wasn't the big sticking point and they could certainly have a lower interest rate than they might have originally proposed to yourselves and others 
a year and a half ago or so. That would be closer. I mean, is that was that the sticking point in the I, discussions up until this point? Yes, sorry, there was something. Yeah, sorry, it's not. It's not actually. It's a separate division which is dealing with this discussion. Sorry, so I'm only. Okay. I'm not central enough to it. Briefly, Deputy so I find it really perverse that a, a League of Credit Unions has been in front of the Department of Finance since last October nearly, when they wrote first uh, and we were aware of it. And nothing has happened, not one house has been built or even one house been planned to be built or gone to planning stage at £3 billion. It's uh, it £5.4 billion over there. <laughs> I, it's a separate section, and the only comment I'd say from the, the evidence in front of the committee was, I suppose, the League of Credit Unions seem to have a cash surplus, cash on hand, and it seems to there's necessity for state funding, but there's also necessity for them to find somewhere and something useful to do it. Deputy Ryan, sorry. Just on that point, I mean, the, the credit unions, when they come in here, confirm that the problem is with their regulator. Not the availability of the funds, they have to get past the regulator first. Yeah. Okay. okay, colleague. In relation to everyone that comes in here talks about the social housing and we talk about affordable housing. Do you see the affordable housing? It's, it's a model that was set out there. It just hasn't worked. No matter what constituency you go into, it hasn't worked. In relation to it. I just want to feel your views in relation to it in yourselves because I know in my own local authority everyone who's in a affordable house to be bailed out in the in the hard times uh, by the state. And I'm just curious to find out in relation to, to yourselves. I'm in an affordable house. How do you mean it hasn't worked? I'm not affordable um, shared ownership. Shared ownership. Yeah. Some of them were very, very expensive in the Some of them were absolutely yeah. crazy and all Yeah, the but there isn't an affordable housing mortgage and that's fine. Yeah, and it's all the all the talk is in relation to off balance sheet, on balance sheet. If we come up with ideas in this committee, Chairman, we have to go back in relation to finance. Is it purpose to say that no matter what we come up with, it has to meet the requirements here and nothing is going to happen at all in terms of what, what our ideas are that we come up with? We're, like, we're sitting here every day and when you have the lads that, I suppose, the problem of the last six years, you said the Minister came to you the last six weeks, but this is something that's gone on for the five, six years. What new, someone said at the first time, what new model have you come up with in relation to get us out of this crisis? We have to get this out of this crisis, not today or tomorrow. Now we have to come up with findings to make it happen, and we're not. I suppose the recommendations we make will be based on the evidence and the, the suggestions that were put forward, so uh, that, that will stand up to scrutiny. Gentlemen, we're about to conclude today. Have you any final comments, and particularly in relation to Deputy Moore? <laughs> oh, okay. At this stage, we're going to conclude this morning's meeting. I would like to thank uh, the NTMA and the Department of Finance, uh, Mr. Conor O'Kelly, Mr. Owen Dorgan, and Mr. John Palmer, for your attendance here today, your submission, and uh, the direct answers. Uh, some of those answers, whether we like them or not, have been very helpful and very informative in the deliberations of th this committee. Thank you very much. We suspend till two o'clock.